Do, do, do. Oh heck. That get earned. Sup Jordan, sup Colby. I was wondering if the stream was actually working there for a minute. <laughs> hey, now we're getting into it. How's it going guys? What's up Alex? What's up Dimitris? What's up guys? Hope you're good. Good morning. Wait, why are you guys all saying good morning? What? No, it's the afternoon actually. <laughs> I joke, of course. I know a lot of, I know like 80%, 90% of my viewership is from America, so. Is this camera not angled very well this way? Hello, Marcus. Some loud fear. How's it going, buddy? LA, 7 a.m. Wow, you guys do like to get up early on a Saturday. So I suspect the stream won't pick up much then until later on today. 8 a.m. Afternoon, Steve. Hello from Italy. Mamma mia. This is a spicy MOSFET. I was just wrapping up some work on my HV amp. We still need to carry that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm down for that. Just need... um. Need to try and think about what to do. So when you say wrapping up some work on your your HV amp, your high voltage amp, is this some, something something that you're designing yourself? Because that's pretty cool. So guys, yeah, nice, awesome stuff, man. Um, yeah, I'd love to design my own amplifier at some point. Uh, I think the um, the knowledge gap between fixing something that already exists, like problem solving, fault finding, and repairing it, going from that to designing something yourself is quite a gap. Um, I know that it looks like I know a lot about amplifiers when I repair them, but really I'm just a good problem solver. I'm good at finding things that are wrong, but not necessarily always knowing why they're there or what their purpose is. But um, the designing is uh, a whole different ball game, and um, I would definitely love to design my amplifier at some point. But I don't feel like I'm quite there yet. We'll take some more reading and stuff, I think, and some more experimentation. So today, <laughs> Visions04 Gaming says, I see some massive 8K half bridge guts, I believe. Two questions, am I right? And two, what brand model looks beefy AF? So, ladies and gentlemen, here we have a Paris 15K. One of the very, very, very few power amplifiers I've ever worked on. I think I've worked on a total of three now. Um, one of them was user error. One of them was just a lemon from the factory. Um, just a bad luck. Uh, and this one I'm not sure on yet because we haven't really looked at it yet. But yeah, this is a Paris 15K. What's your fa what, uh, what is your favorite amp to date? 
Ah, uh, difficult, really difficult to answer that. I do love the JBL Crown A6000 GTI. It's just such an awesome piece of kit. Um, yeah, I like different amps for different reasons. It's really difficult to pinpoint one down. I'd have to sit down and think about all the different amps that I've come across and used and stuff. I do like I do like a lot of the Alpine stuff um, just because of how freaking amazingly complicated it is. Um, and it's really well engineered. Alpine amps are beautifully engineered. Freaking awesome pieces of kit. Way above my pay grade. Way above my knowledge scale. Um, like repairing an Alpine amplifier is always a massive headache. <laughs> Favorite budget amp. Uh, it had to be the JBL GTO 14001 for a long time. Proper awesome, awesome um, amplifier for the money. Um, in recent times, it probably is like the Smart 3. Amazing value for money. The Stetson and Sandistor amps are really stressed at 400 volts. So I assume Mr. Loudfear is designing and working on something that is um, less stressed at the higher end of the scale, closer to 5, 550, 600 volts perhaps. Sub guys, sub guys. On the JBO Crown ones, I didn't like that they had the power supply switching frequency within a human hearing range. Yeah, that is really annoying. You can hear it buzzing. It is very annoying, that. But um, for, its, for its time, it was really cool. I still don't really know why JBL designed the power supply side around such a low switching frequency. I still don't really understand why that was done. Um, because at the time that was designed, we were well into you know having fast switching frequency power supplies in in hundreds of amplifiers way earlier than that, um, and obviously you can make the transformer much much smaller by having the the faster the faster switching frequency on the power supply. Um, I'd love to get in contact with one of the designers actually that worked on that power supply and just be like, yo, love this. Um, but uh, what was the reasoning behind this decision, this decision, etc. Just kind of get some background info on it, it'd be really cool. So yeah, for anyone just joining, this is a Paras PW15000, so 15,000 15, watt amplifier. Um, coming out of Brazil, made by parent company Causus. One of my absolute favorite and most recommended amplifiers to date is the Paras PW line. These are absolute monsters. Um, not sure what happened to this one, but we'll find out. Looks like we've got a power supply section failure at least. The new EV architecture runs at 800 volts. Holy fuck, man. So, that is such scary, scary voltages at the amount of current that they can deliver. 800 volts from batteries. Whew. You do not want to go anywhere near that shit. So the Paras PW15K is rated for 15,000 watts RMS at 12 volts. And I think it does about 18 and a half thousand watts at 14 volts. This is a big amplifier. Yeah, I'd be well interested in designing an amplifier for um, for high voltage use, like how um, Loud Fiat here is is doing so. But I don't know how the hell I would test it. Like, how would I even prototype a board like that? 
I would not want to go anywhere near 800 volts DC. How the heck would, uh, how the hell do you start prototyping something like that and testing it? At those high voltages as well, there's so much that can go wrong. There's so much, so many issues you can have with like ringing and spikes, voltage spikes across the board, capacitance, like as the voltage increases, so does all the headaches that come with designing something, especially something high frequency, high voltage, just absolute nightmare. So, as far as I'm aware, uh, actually, I think there, there's a handful of um, Taramps and Stetson high voltage amplifiers floating around the UK. I have never seen one. I think I would probably turn it down if, if, if someone said to me, hey, I've got this, this high voltage amplifier to repair. I'd turn it down, not because I'd not because I'm uncertain I'll be able to fix it, but just I don't have the testing equipment here to run it. Like all my bench power supplies and everything set up for 12 volts. Um, I guess I could um, take a donor board, um, a power supply, you know, um, something that can step up the 12 volts to like sort of 300, 400 volts or something, and uh, I could run the amplifier that way to test it out. But it would, it would do me a bit of a heck. It would scare me a bit. How many, how many vehicles do you have, and what systems do you have do you have in them? So I have two vehicle. Uh, I have three vehicles. Two, two, two main vehicles. Got my Proton, which most of you all know, and I've got the Vito, the van, which also most of you will probably know. And the van, I've got the uh, two DDZ 415s, and in the Proton, I've just got an SQ system, um, the T-line door cards, the A pillars with the uh, three-inch AW3s and AT28 tweeters, and a big Genesis amplifier in the boot. Loud fear, I run my amps at 400 volts. Uh, the Stetson Force Extreme, I also ran the Force One and the Sound Digital HV Evo 2. The Tyrants HV Chip Chipio only run to mid 200 volts. The old 150s run at 400, but don't make them anymore. Have you had any issues with them, uh, Loud fear? Have you had any? Um, if you hadn't had any of them pop, like the only experience that I've heard of them, people coming to me like they, they ran them in uh, in parts of Europe and stuff, or um, is that they they lasted like ten minutes and then they blew up. Um, there was a guy in the UK running a Taramps um, 150, I think it was, and as far as I'm aware, that that's still running. I think that's running fine. I don't think he's had any issues with it, or if he has, he hasn't contacted me about it. So. Yes, the sound digital popped, but the Stetson was bulletproof. Interesting. I wonder what the build quality on the Stetson's like. Really, the only Stetson amplifiers I've had experience with repairing have been the export line, and the build quality is atrocious. They are like a flexible trampoline inside. Seddon says, also at high frequency and high voltage, you have huge voltage transients. So any stray capacitance can kill an IC in an instant. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Yeah, absolute headache to design, I'm sure. Why don't we just instead <laughs> make, some, uh, make some voice coils that are... Um, in the sub ohm territory, like 0.02. How about that? 0.02 ohm voice coil, and then you can just run the, the, an amplifier off the 12 volt battery. Not even need a power supply section. Just run run the rails at 12 volts, and just have monstrously high current to this uh, this voice coil. <laughs> I'm joking. I, I, don't, I don't even th I don't even think that. Um, well, I've no idea really, but I suspect that. The, the way that a loudspeaker works would probably break down a bit once you start making the coil like sub ohm territory. Like deep sub ohm territory. I'm sure that there would be issues there. Otherwise, it probably would have been done already, wouldn't it? Lots of screws in these things. Right, are we all good to go? on the main board. I think probably we are. Okay, let's take the ones out the side.
Loud Fear, I just got four DDZ 415s. Uh, I'll be running at a local show on the 4th. Awesome. Those are probably the ones with the new um, orange or yellow colored spiders, correct? Because my Z4s, yeah, they're still good, but I've had nothing but absolute headaches with the spiders. They're just the worst thing and absolutely pissed me off right off. So, yeah, I'm very, very unhappy with my Z4s. Um, everything else about them is fine. The motor's great, voice call's great, everything. Yeah, they're, they're awesome subs, but just the spiders, I uh, just had constant issues with. Um, so, yeah, not, not the biggest fan, but probably they've resolved the issues that they were having with them now, um, now that they've gone to the yellow or orange spiders. Um, but, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm stuck with mine. I already had to send one of them back to the States to have it rebuilt. And now the same thing has happened to the other one. Yeah, they, they already rebuilt one of them. Um, and I had to pay shipping back to the States, despite all the, all the stuff I've done with Didi in the past, I had to pay shipping back to the States. It was a warranty issue, you know, so um, obviously they had to cover it anyway, because it was all under warranty, and they they agreed that it wasn't user error, um, that it was um, yeah an issue with the spiders, that I've actually been able to replicate with lots of other customer subs that have come over. So it's not just the Z4s that suffered with this spider issue, but also lots of other models, um, like 3500 series, uh, 9900 series have had this issue as well. Um, but yeah, I had to pay shipping back from the UK, which was very expensive, and uh, yeah, same things happened to the second one, so really, really pissed off, really annoyed. Um, I don't really know how to explain what happened to the spiders. Um, it's, it's like an it's, it's almost like an uneven break in. They get a notch, so one of the rolls towards the outer edge of the spider. Um, so obviously the spiders break in and they should break in evenly, etc. One of the rolls towards the outer edge of the of the surround will become drastically looser i think than the rest of the ones around it and when you put when the cone gets moved outwards okay it'll move outwards and obviously you have force that that um suppresses your move the, the cone's movement so you move the cone the cone moves out and, and it'll get to a point and then the kind of it'll go over a notch where it's like and it will suddenly become really really easy to push past that point um, and then on the way back again, you feel it again as like a notch on the way back. And what, what that means is, and what that um, does when you are driving the woofers to relatively high excursion, um, still well within their mechanical limits, but as, as the excursion starts reaching that notch, the whole cone gets pushed outwards to a new oscillation midpoint. So it goes, so the cone excursion will, will go like, like it will get pushed outwards fully. Um, and sounds horrendous and also the um, impedance rise dips massively so the coil gets warm and it's, it's awful and yeah had it happen to one of them and um, now the other one's doing it and that issue also occurred on a 3500 series and a 9900 series that we had over here um, I've also seen it on a 3510 as well, although slightly less extreme because it had a soft spider, but it still did do it. Um, never seen it before with any other woofer, any other brand, you know. Seddon says, if you think about it, a sub-ohm territory coil would be brilliant since the highest amount of waste power is wasted on the DC resistance. So a million voice call would be interesting at least. I don't know if it, I don't know how it would interact with a fixed magnet. I don't know I don't know whether it would change the magnetic field created by it being such a low impedance. No idea how that would work. Whether there'd be enough turns in the in a, in a gap. I have no idea. I, I, I'm not a, not a sub with a designer, so I don't really know know about that. But it would be an interesting experiment for sure if uh, if it was done. Oh, I think this might be the 0.5 ohm version. 
So this is a Powerus PW15000, absolute monster amplifier. Seems to have some dead power supply MOSFETs. We're going to find out why. But um, I haven't actually checked. I didn't bother looking at the front. I think this is the 0.5 ohm version because it has um, 90 N20D MOSFETs, which are 90 amp, 200 volt MOSFETs. So they're very high current, but they are lower voltage than what would be used in a 15,000 watt. Um, yeah, in a 15,000 watt um, one ohm amplifier. Okay, have we removed all of the screws that is required to get this board out? On there, oh, there's one hiding in there. Let's see if we can get that out. There's one on the PSU section, let's have a look. Oh yeah, one on the PSU section as well. So yeah, just this one here, and also one on the PSU section. There we go. Oh yeah, if you had sub-ohm coils, your speaker wires would have to be like zero gauge. <laughs> that would be a thing, wouldn't it? I was hoping that this would this board would all slide to the left or the right and then unhook the end plate from one side and then pull it out but um, I think oh yeah because the end plates are locked into place the end plates are gonna have to come off that's fine that's okay no problem we'll take the power end plate off I think Sub technical specialist, good afternoon in the UK. Yep, absolutely. Are all those screws identical? Not exactly, no. You ever work on the Soundstream 10.0? I love those amps. Maybe. It does ring a bell, but if I have, then it's not been for a long time. I 
have my old subs fold the cone so it would have so much X Max and die it a few days later. They were Def Bond's Machete series subs. <laughs> so you'd push it so hard that the uh, actual cone would fold over with uh, with how how far you were trying to push the cone. <laughs> That's pretty pretty mad. Okay. Now this is a very very heavy PCB. It is thick. The board is thick, but it is very heavy. There's a lot of heavy caps, a lot of heavy transformers, and heavy inductors on here. So the board probably will flex a little bit as it comes out, and that's actually okay. But uh, we'll try and minimize that as much as possible. Is there a screw that I've missed on the side here? Nope. There we go. Place that there carefully, put the end piece back on. Now I need to get the heatsink off of the desk in addition to put, taking this up. So let's lift her up a little bit. There we go. The one, the one handed, the one handed 15k hold. Lovely stuff. Take that off, pop that down the side here. There we go. Okay, so here we have a power supply section with some dead power supply fets. Now, Paris were very kind, kind enough to send over a full power supply repair kit, replacement kit. So here we have a bag of RF1404 MOSFETs, some gate resistors, 10 ohm gates, and um, ah, some Mylar thermal heatsink tape stuff, pretty cool. Uh, although what they doesn't look like they've sent over is a drive IC, which is okay. I don't expect them to send stuff over, but um, for this one they have. It's just to confirm what we got. So yeah, just the FETs, no drive IC I don't think in here. Fets and gates. We might need to replace the driver. Uh, I think the driver, actually, no, there, no, there isn't a driver on these, is there? That's one of the core cool things I liked about this, in a way. There are arguments for and against using um, chip drivers, but I think the drivers for the power supply side are all over here, and they're actually, actually these great big um, surface mount transistors here, which are going to be really, really rugged and uh, probably aren't going to die that easily in a power supply event failure. So that's really cool. So the driver is probably absolutely fine, which is why they haven't included it. Included it. Okay. Let's start removing all of these MOSFETs then, shall we? I'm going to turn on the big soldering iron for this. Hey Sam, have you seen amps that actually play music from inside inductors? Why is that happening? Um, yeah, so the inductor will just be ringing a bit, or you'll have you'll have loose winds, and uh, as obviously the audio signal passes through, um, yeah, they can vibrate slightly with the um, magnetic field and the you know the the way that the inductor is working. Uh, also probably a similar reason to why you get coil wine if you've ever had a graphics card if you're into into high-end PCs if you ever had a graphics card that is um, pretty silent but then starts hissing as soon as you load up a bench test or a game or something like that same same thing like that I 
Hey guys, how's it going? How's it going? I had a crescendo that had a terrible high-pitched whine after warmed up. Yep, seen that before. It's just the transformer coil whine, and you can uh, get rid of it just by wiggling the transformer backwards and forwards a little bit, reseating it, reshifting where the uh, leads are um, are spaced and are positioned, and that that will get rid of it. Yeah, this is some very very beefy traces you can see here. Got some um, really, really thick bars that are soldered onto the back of the PCB. It actually all looks beautiful. This is a really, really nicely assembled PCB. You've also got these uh, these fuse fusible wires here. I actually, I covered all or covered the uh, these amplifiers in detail actually on um, on my Paris uh, video that I did. So if you want to see all of these features, all the things that Paris have uh, put into this board for repairability and serviceability and reliability then you can go and check that out but yeah these are absolutely fantastically designed amps really really cool so yeah let's start taking some of these fets out This is probably going to take us a little while because there is hefty thermal mass in this board. Actually, you know what would be really useful on a board like this? We need to preheat it a little bit. So let's grab the uh, heat gun. Where is the heat gun? Where, how, where did I put my heat gun? Ah, there it is. Nah, so that's this isn't an official thing that they do. Paris don't officially like supply amplifier repair. I'm, I'm doing this to angle my voice up at my mic. Um, they don't officially sell amplifier repair kits. Um, but for this one, I explained the cause of failure and what needs to be done and the cost that it would be to repair it. And um, it was actually cheaper for Paris or for the distributor in the UK to get the parts supplied by Paris direct rather than have me order parts from a UK supplier. So that's why Paris have sent over parts for this one. Paris, I don't think they generally will supply amplifier repair kits to anyone. But uh, in this situation, the UK distributor reached out to Paris and said, hey, can we, can we grab some of these parts because they're really expensive in the UK and they sent them over. Okay, I think we should be good to go now. So 
I suspect these will probably come out a lot easier now. Oh yeah, much quicker than what it would have been. It probably would still help to flood the um, pads with some fresh solder as well, but having some heat in the board makes a huge difference. It still does take a while. The ground traces are so thick on this board. Jan says, recapping a Technics SUV85A, can't find replacement caps for the power supply. It's a um, 100,000 100, microfarad 4-pin caps. Just solder in 4 times 2-pin caps to replace them, or any idea where to get 4-pin replacements. Yeah, I would just literally solder in whatever you can find that is a good capacitor that makes up the capacitance that you're missing. That's uh, going to be absolutely fine. Um, I personally have never actually seen any 4-pin capacitors, seeing as I, I only work on um, car amplifiers. It might not be a bad idea to put together repair kits. Would be able to justify buying parts in bulk from the big guys. Yeah, not a bad idea. Man, thanks to Mark Jackie for the five notifications. Once again, failed. Nice to catch you live, buddy. Yeah, they don't. I don't understand. I don't understand YouTube notifications. Um, you know, actually, loads of creators have actually taken to just pinging everyone in their discords. Um, when they release a video, just so that everyone actually gets a push notification. <laughs> That's a good point, actually. Uh, Wilton says the extra two pins are just anchors. So if you've got the four pin capacitor, I would actually just double check that the four pads on the board actually go to some part of the circuit and aren't just like empty um, pads for um, anchoring the part down. I think the heat is starting to escape this board a little bit. <laughs> already it's got a high thermal mass and it's got a high th high surface area as well 
So any heat you do put into the board will escape relatively quickly. This is one of these jobs where this amplifier is not particularly difficult to repair. Like, all of, I'm pretty sure all I've got to do is change the power supply fetch and change the gate resistors. But it's just tedious. So I thought I would jump on stream and have a chat to you guys while I'm doing it. So if you've got some Q&A, if you want to get some di discussion topics going, then uh, yeah, drop some in the chat. We'll, we'll get chatting about some stuff. So this, is, this is relatively low mental capacity work right here that I'm doing now. Famous last words. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure I know why this one died, so um, I'm almost certain there's no output section issues. But yeah, could, could just be famous last words. What's up, Pradeep? How's it going? No, so th this this one failed because the um, there was a tiny tiny piece of solder or metal swarf in between the back of one of the MOSFETs and the thermal pad, and it shorted through to the heat sink. So it was a manufacturing defect on this one. Um, just really annoying. Like just a just a bit of stupid bit of metal just got in between the um, the FETs and the heat sink. So it wasn't a circuit failure. It was an assembly failure. Just a really, just a really annoying, stupid thing that can happen sometimes. And um, the uh, the bit of metal obviously wasn't spiking through to the heatsink enough that it didn't fail during initial testing in the factory. It needed a little bit of vibrations from being in, in a vehicle to actually uh, spike that bit of metal through the thermal pad and then to the short to the heatsink. Just, just really unfortunate. Do you have any idea where I can buy the original MK328 tester? Yeah, I know. It's really difficult, isn't it? I, I, I just got so lucky because the one that I've got was the first one I ever ordered off Amazon, I think it was, and it just so happens to be the, um, the good one. Um, you know the cheap ones? They are actually functionally identical. Um, sorry, the cheap ones, the fake ones, the ones with the limited functionality. They are um, actually identical to the real ones. The only thing that's different is the firmware. So, if I could figure out a way to get the uh, the firmware off of the one that I've got, off of the chip on the one that I've got, and uh, upload it somewhere, or like be able to flash some, some chips with the firmware that's in the one that I've got, then I could sell all of you guys the good MK328s. But that is not something that I've ever looked into before. And... Um, I don't know whether they're like locked or like something like that. And, and also I wouldn't want to ruin my one in trying to do that and brick it because then I'd be without one. I'd be in the same situation as you guys. Uh, the reason that I know that that's possible, the reason that I know that the uh, the bad, the, the um, fake ones are the same is because my MK328 actually failed. So my original one that I purchased from Amazon, my legit one, actually failed. And um, it, like you'd press the button, the backlight would come on, but nothing would come up on the screen. And I was like, oh man, that sucks. So I ordered a couple more. I ordered two more from different sellers. And when they arrived, they were both just the, um, just the, the low functionality ones. Uh, and I was like, oh, fuck's sake. So I... I, you know, me being me and fixing stuff, I took them apart and I, I looked at whether the boards were different. The boards were identical, so I identified which was the ROM chip, which chip actually contained the uh, the software that this thing runs on, and I swapped the ROM chip from my original dead one with one of the new limited functionality ones that I ordered, and it worked, and I had the full functionality back. So the part that died in my original one wasn't the ROM chip, it was obviously something else on the board. Um, and um, yeah, I was just able to swap the ROM chip over and it worked great. So I know that they're the same and the only difference is the firmware.
Uh, Loud Fear says, how often do you see vibration induced damage? I would probably say, well, there, there's been periods of time when literally every one out of two amplifiers that have come into the workshop have been vibration damage related. I would say out of 10 amplifiers that I repair, about three or four of them are vibration damage related. Um, whether it's uh, a shorting and rubbing inductor on the output side, whether it's snap MOSFET legs or short and rubbing um, trans transformer legs, um, yeah, or like uh, surface mount resistors that just have cracked solar joints as a result of the board flexing. Quite a lot of um, opportunities for that to happen, and yeah, I do I do get quite a lot of them. Are the multi-purpose component testers any good for testing ESR? Um, I don't know how accurate they are, but usually you can instantly tell a bad capacitor from a good one uh, because the ESR will be in the thousands of ohms um, as opposed to a good example that you would test that might be, you know, below 10 ohms or something like that. Whether the ESR reading is accurate or not is not really that important. Um, it's just whether it's in a range that you expect it to be in. Yeah, home sub plate amps are a key thing for this. It's like, it, when you think about it, it's really stupid, isn't it? Why the hell, why aren't plate amplifiers designed to deal with the vibrations from the sub that they're actually being mounted to? It's almost like they don't care. That was why the Yamaha sub that I spent five, six years fixing originally failed was vibration damage. Sam, do you know of any car amp that can deliver high power into higher impedances? Eight ohms. I want to drive a PA sub drive in my car because I already have it and why not use it? So the problem with driving high impedance loads in, in um, car audio is that the only real way to do it is to just buy a more powerful amplifier than you need that's rated into a lower impedance and just run it at a higher impedance. That means that you'll be paying far more than you need to be paying because you'll be buying a 2000 watt amplifier and you'll only be using 500 watts from it but really that's the only thing you can do um, my best suggestion is to buy one of the brazilian amplifiers that is a 4 ohm version there are some models of amplifier offered by the brazilian brands like taramps and um, stetson and uh, banda which are 4 ohm versions they they do their power into four ohms so that means that you're if you're running an eight ohm sub that means that you're only going to be losing half of the amplifier's rated power as opposed to if you were to use a one ohm rated amplifier and run it at eight ohms you'd be losing two times four times you'd be losing yeah you'd be losing eight times the power so if you if you bought a an eight thousand watt rms amplifier and ran it at eight ohms you'd only be getting a thousand watts out of it so you're paying the, the price for an 8K and you're getting 1K. So it sucks. So yeah, try and buy the highest impedance rated amplifier you can. I think the highest one I've seen is a 4 ohm model. Use that and then you're not wasting as much power. Um, another option is, you say you've already got a PA driver. Can you get a second one? If you can get a second one, run the PA drivers in isobaric and I'll just run two of them, like in regular side by side, and then you can drop down to four ohms. And by dropping down to four ohms, you also open up the you open up the uh, possibility of using one of the four ohm version amplifiers from these Brazilian brands. Or if you don't need that much power, you can run a two channel class AB amplifier bridged because they do their power into four ohms. Because um, you you'll have two ohm per channel stability and then four ohm bridge. So. And there's also quite there's also probably quite a few two ohm sorry quite a few two channel um, amplifiers that are class D that you could bridge up to four ohms as well. But yeah, it's not ideal. You probably get better results selling the PA driver even for like twenty or thirty bucks, and then using that twenty thirty bucks 
to buy just a low end car sub, something that's four ohm or like a dual four, you know, for sort of 20, 30 bucks, like I don't know, Sony Explod or something old like that. Um, you probably get better results than you would with a PA driver anyway. Yeah, plan, planned obsolescence. Yeah, even if it's not planned, I think that it's not cared about. Um, it will probably last a year. It will probably take longer than a year for a plate amplifier to fail due to vibration damage. And you know, unless you're like pounding test tones for eight hours a day. But um, yeah, if it's outside the warranty period and fails, hey, they don't literally care about it. They do not care about. It. There's a very, very few brands that care if your product failed after the warranty period like why would they care it's it's a business there are a few companies that make products that are actually passionate about reliability and longevity but unfortunately they're usually not the companies that really succeed financially or they end up being you know really big brands because it's not profitable to care it's, it's sad it's not profitable to care about the longevity of your products past the warranty period it, it's just not there are very very few exceptions where a company will build its whole business model based on the fact that they do care about the product beyond the one year mark and support it indefinitely um, there are, are probably a few companies that that's their whole business model but not all business model not not all industries will work that way and it won't always be possible to design a company with that mindset and have it be successful so the kinds of products that you can buy where the company does care about the longevity of the product is going to be from a small company small business a couple of guys building stuff not really making a bunch of money on it maybe doing it on the side similar similar to if I was design if I was to design an amplifier if I was to design and sell amplifiers then I wouldn't expect to, you know, turn into some great big huge ma mass amp producing company. I'd just be doing it for the love of it and the passion of it. And it wouldn't be very profitable because, you know, at the end of the day, once everyone's bought an amp, they've bought an amp. And if it never dies, then there's no, there's no repeat sales. Zapco repaired my amp outside of warranty because when they received it and the technician had a close look, he found some defects from production that had caused some issues. Oh, nice. So even though it was out of warranty, the technician... See, but th that's the technician there working for Zapco. The, the technician working for Zapco is probably really, uh, really passionate about what he does. And if he is working in an environment where he can make a, a suggestion or make a statement um, to the higher ups and say, hey, look, this amp's come in and it's, you know, it's actually failed because of this issue from manufacturing, or whatever. Um, and if the, if the higher ups are like, well, you know, obviously that's down to him to say that. And if the higher ups are like a chill, then they're like, yeah, cool. We'll, we'll do this, do this one for free. That is, that's, that's quite good of them. Because that could very easily just be like swept under the under the rug, couldn't it? You know, if it's out of warranty, regardless of what the technician finds, they they much rather charge you for a repair.
What wattage is your soldering iron? Looks big. Yeah, it's a 200 watt. <laughs> it's pretty chunky. I think it was made in 1990... Wait, the, I think the last inspection was in 1993 or something. It's an old boy and it is chunky. Yeah, if, if, I, was if I was trying to do this desoldering work with my regular like 60, 70 watt iron, I would be having the worst day. But this, this is making it relatively easy. All the heat that I dumped into the board earlier with the with the heat gun is pretty much disappeared now. Yeah, the, the board is like room temperature again now. It is getting a little bit difficult, so maybe I'll dump some more heat into the board real quick. Thanks to Blue Duck for the five. I picked up a new old stock Phoenix Gold Xenon. Xenon from the mid 2000s. Are any internals prone to failure on these arms? Not sure. I don't actually think I've ever worked on one of those. So, um, yeah, send, send me a, a guts picture to bearvids, uh, facebook.com forward slash bearvids. Send me a picture over the inside if you want to take the, the back off, of course. If you don't, then that's no worries. Or if you can Google a guts picture, send it to me and I'll have a look at what's inside. And I'll, I'll probably be able to tell you where some failure points might be. Someone asks, what's your favorite brand of solder? Leaded. Is my only answer to that. Don't care what the sticker says. I don't care what brand it's from. If it's leaded, it's good to go. Yeah, the lead-free stuff is crumbly. That's the only way I can describe lead-free solder is that it is kind of crumbly. Do you know what I mean? When you um, when you heat it up, like you get a big thick trace of it um, on an amplifier from the factory, and you heat it up, and it just kind of like it's, it's like molten rock almost or something. It's really weird. Right, that's one side all done. I've got to flip around and do the other side. Oh man, this has cooled down so much already. You saw how much heat I put into the board there. This has cooled down so much already, I can pretty much just touch it. It's fine. Uh.
This is a 1400 watt, watt um, heat gun. Like he's freaking roasting out the end here. Yeah, there's honestly not much flex on this board, given how how big it is. It's really nice. It's uh, partly thanks to these great big bars down here. These are actually really thick. They're probably about 8 mil thick, those bars. But yeah, it's a very thick PCB, lots and lots of thermal mass, lots of metal inside of it. Episode 3 Boom or Bust was cool. I didn't, also didn't see you posted a video on the Crown and Turamps that played after Boom or Bust and that was interesting. Oh, thanks Matt K. Appreciate your, your kind words there. Yeah, Boom or Bust is, uh, is, is very fun to film. <laughs> it's good, good fun. Good fun to check out all these designs. Once we've repaired this board actually, if you like, seeing as you guys are my loyal live stream buddies, we could have a look at some of the submissions that have come through and we could decide together which one is going to be printed for episode 4, what do you reckon? We can do a poll and you guys can decide what you want to see for episode 4. I've got some really interesting designs come in, so we'll have a look through some of them. Like I said before, this uh, th this repair I'm doing here isn't going to require much brain power. It's literally just desoldering MOSFETs, change a few gate resistors, refit MOSFETs. But uh, I was kind of bored, so I thought I'd jump on stream and have a chat to you guys while I'm doing it. Yes, the uh, the designs are getting a big, a bit big and impractical, aren't they, for a single twelve? <laughs> I honestly hadn't really anticipated that that um, the designs would just be absolutely massive. See, so, yeah, my my benchmark aeroported box was a sensible size and it would easily fit in the boot of a of a car, but um, yeah, both the uh, both the Derek V5 and the um, the half um, wicked one is is pretty big, but not all of the designs that have been sent through are big. I think that's just a coincidence. Firstly, the Derek V5, I didn't actually realise how big it was when I was looking at it on the PC on Cura. I was like, oh yeah, sweet, it looks kind of cool. And when it started printing the first layer, I was like, oh shit, this is freaking massive. So that was that was kind of um, oversight. Not to say that I won't print big ones, but um, yeah, the big ones I don't think are going to generally perform that great. Um, although Derek's one did perform better than ever so slightly better than my um, benchmark airport. It was like point something of a dB, 
and the driver wouldn't have lasted long in like a permanent install with that box. It was just so big, it was moving so far to extremes all the time. Um, obviously the uh, Wicked one is quite a big box because because it has the, the horn mouth on it. It's a, it's a big box for a single 12. The, the thing with the, um, the Wicked one is that even the half Wicked one that I printed, because I didn't change, well, no, sorry, I didn't change. I didn't design it, it was sent in. But because the mouth size wasn't changed over the two over the the dual uh, enclosure adding the second um driver to the wicked one half that i printed wouldn't really add that much more you know volume it wouldn't really take up that much more space so yeah really that box that we did last one episode three was kind of almost the size of a twin 12 box but only with a single driver in it so Yeah, I've got some uh, some designs that have been sent in that are much more sensible on the sizing. Some sixth orders, some fourth orders. Um, I've had uh, a few, two or three very similar looking slot ports sent in. So what I was thinking of doing for maybe episode four, five or six or something down the line would be rather than doing one enclosure per episode, let's say I, I had two or three very similar looking enclosures sent in. I'd print all three of them and we'd have a shootout. So let's say... Boomer Bast episode six, um, Battle of the Sixth Orders, and there'd be like two or three similar sort of size, similar design Sixth Orders, and we battle them out and do them both, all three of them in one episode head to head to see which one of those is the loudest. I'm really, really, really pleased to hear your, your guys' kind words about Boomer Bast. I'm, I'm glad that it, it panned out. <laughs> that it was that it worked out well and that you guys like it so obviously obviously it was a bit of a risk um me buying the buying the printer and working out all the all the you know way it was going to work and building the test cabin and stuff like that was quite a bit of time to do so i'm glad that it's uh it, you guys like it I wasn't actually expecting the half wicked one to pull away so far ahead as it did. It's, it's, it is solidly in the lead, like four or five dBs in the lead. I think that my benchmark error ported box could do better um, given more power. I think that, yeah, I think that it's a little bit small for a scaled 500 watt driver to really sort of come alive. Um, so I think if, if we, used a different driver that was a more powerful that maybe scaled to about 1500 watts rms and b had a stiffer suspension and better cone control on the higher frequencies like 45 and 60 scaled hertz um i think it would perform much better the problem is with the driver i've got at the moment right that peerless driver it said that the fs on the spec sheet was like 180 hertz so I was like, great, okay, yeah, this model's okay in my tests. It seems to be around around the right sort of, you know, resonant frequency for a, a low power 500 watt driver, but that can still play across the range. In reality, the driver is not sitting at 180 hertz FS. It's sitting at 116. So that scales to 19 hertz FS, which is very, very low. Doesn't have very much mechanical control of the cone at all which is why the wicked one did so well at the higher frequencies because it had the air spring in the seal chamber to help it now i didn't want that to be be a thing i didn't want that to mean that everyone's going to design fourth orders or things with with um stiff air springs in the enclosure to make it be good at the upper frequencies i wanted it just to be a driver that works well in whatever you put it in and uh and the box is the only thing that matters really but Yes, annoyingly, the driver is not quite in spec to the spec sheet, so, but we've chosen it now, so we'll have to stick with it for season one, and we can change it for season two, get something more interesting. Now, where is my solder sucker? What have I done with that? There it is.
So most of the boxes are going to have a large flat panel. Maybe you can pre-print a plate and reuse it on different boxes to save some time slash material. Yeah, that's not a bad idea actually. Um, print like the base and then just stick each box onto the base um, provided it you know has a top like that. That would actually be a, not a bad idea. What I didn't want to do is because yeah that's actually makes sense. What I was thinking, I, I did think of that, I thought why don't I just print one lid one lid that is the maximum dimensions and just put that on top of every box. But because I was thinking of a lid, I was thinking, well, having that great big lid on top would change how the wave loads off the enclosure off the top and would actually maybe change the response slightly. But if I do it as a base, then obviously that won't matter. So that's a good idea. I think I'll probably do that. I'll print a, um, a maximum dimensions base and that will save some time and material definitely. Uh, but some of the some of the designs that have been sent in are so far withdraw so far um, away from a standard box shape that that it wouldn't um, apply to those. But but it would apply to lots of lots of the other ones that have been sent in. So that's not a bad idea. Can you make a sealed box for it so we can see the main difference compared to a standard sealed box? Um, if somebody wants to design a seal box and send it in, then I'll do it, yeah. I don't want to make one episode be another box I've designed. So if somebody wants to design a seal box and submit it, then yeah, maybe I'll print it. Maybe we'll do a sealed episode. Or if you don't think that it would be that interesting to have a whole episode dedicated to a sealed box, maybe I'll just print... Actually, okay, instead of printing a new box, what do you guys think about me just using my benchmark aeroport test box and just plugging the port? I can't remember how much, how many cubic foot it's got. I think it's about two cubic foot. It'd be a bit big. It'd be a little bit big for a sealed box. Um, but I could just plug the port of my benchmark aero and run some tests on that just to see how that fares up. Um, or if you think the boxes would be too big, I could put something inside to take up some space add some kind of displacement inside the box to shrink it internally and plug the port just to get just to get a rough idea as to what a sealed box would do stuff it with some lego yeah exactly that's that's what i'm thinking What do you guys think about weekly episodes? Is a week too long to wait? Should I do two a week? If you guys like it that much, you're probably going to say, yeah, I do two a week. I could try and do two a week. It doesn't take too long. It doesn't take too long to, obviously, the prints take usually a maximum of about a day. Um, although they'll probably be quicker because now I've bought myself um, a 0.6... Um, 0.6 nozzles, so they'll probably be quicker. So yeah, maximum print time would be like a day to print it and you know clean it up or whatever. Then once it's printed, um, all I've got to do is yeah, just sit down and turn the camera on, say my stuff, run the tests. The longest part of Boom or Bust actually is editing. Editing those um, those uh, episodes actually takes the longest amount of time. Like I, I, it takes me a solid whole day from like when I wake up in the morning to pretty much when I go to bed in the evening to edit one of those. No, to, to, to film and edit. Film and edit takes, takes a full 24 hours. Two a week would be awesome if you can handle it. How about two boxes per episode? Yeah, I could do two boxes per episode um, if they were similar enough. The thing is, at the moment, the episodes are already 18 to 20 minutes long. Now, generally, for a kind of you know a, a, a kind of series thing like this on YouTube, you don't want the videos being longer than like half an hour because people just drop off. Like, you look at the uh, retention rate, and um, yeah, past the sort of 
25 minute mark people just get bored or they get busy or they got other stuff to do and they they just abandon the video so i don't want if, if i'm going to be doing two per episode i'm going to have to try and cut back somewhere either i'm going to have to try and cut back on the um explanation of the impedance graph um the impedance sweep i could cut back on the explanation of that a bit i could instead of going into detail about the shape i could just kind of show you it and be like yeah this is doing this this is this, this this and then boom onto demos um also the demos would have to be shorter because obviously if i'm doing two boxes then i'd have clips from both of them so that would take a bit longer and then obviously the tests for both of them would take longer so either the video is going to have to be almost twice as long or i'm going to have to really cut out some content to do two boxes per episode unless they were very similar boxes like with the shootouts with the sixth orders or the um the uh, ported boxes if I'm doing a shootout between two ported boxes, then I could, you know, probably just make it be really, really quick and simple, just comparing the two. I'd like two a week. <laughs> I'll, I'll give a go at doing two a week. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, guys, what is it? It's Saturday today. So I released the last one yesterday. So if we can decide, if we can decide on a box to do, to print today after I finish this amplifier repair then I'll give it a go printing it overnight this evening and um, then maybe next week maybe um, Monday I'll film it edit it on Tuesday maybe try and get it out Wednesday or something like that I'm actually yeah we'll, we'll see how it goes Yeah, so I'll show you guys in a minute, literally, I want to show you guys so much stuff, but I've got my hands full, full of this soldering right at the minute. But I'll show you guys the audience retention graph from the last three episodes of Boom or Bust, and you guys can kind of see see where people are watching the most. Um, what, pe what, what bits people are interested in, what, what bits people aren't interested in. What about if you did it like a live stream to save the editing? The problem with doing it as a live stream is that it would work great at the time for the for the people that are watching live but anyone that is not watching live that wants to watch it back later to do a live stream of, of boom or bust would probably be an hour long stream and most people aren't going to want to want to sit aren't going to want to sit through that and also doing it live i wouldn't be able to do those really cool demo um, videos because you know you know the videos of the sub playing yeah they're played those tracks are played at times six speed and then they're filmed in slow motion on my phone and um, then obviously slowed down um, in in Vegas in the in the video editing so they look like real life face test videos um, you know demo videos so I wouldn't be able to do that live because obviously it would be in real time so there's a lot that I wouldn't be able to do if I did it live I think that it I think that it works well as a edited series I can make it snappy I can make it f edited quite fun um, so yeah I think we'll keep it keep it as edited videos Um, but yeah, if anyone's got any any like ideas for Boom or Bust and they think, hey, Sam, you should do this. I know some people have said that it would be really cool to have like a smoke test kind of thing. So like fill the box with some smoke, put a Perspex top on and uh, play some tones and sort of see how the smoke accumulates around the, the, the box. I don't know if that would work. I don't know if smoke actually does that or not. Uh, maybe some kind of polystyrene balls actually would would be better. Fill the you know put some polystyrene balls inside the box and see where they all accumulate, or some something else something something else similar to that. Um, what do people do? people use sand, don't they? People use sand for surfaces, but I need something that didn't accumulate based on surface resonances, but based on actual um, air pressure differences. So that's why I'm thinking smoke. Mm. 
you can add smoke with your soldering iron, a cotton ball, and oil, some kind of oil, baby oil. No need for a smoke machine. Oh, that's actually a really cool idea. Because, yeah, I was thinking my smoke machine is a uh, pretty, pretty hefty, <laughs> hefty big boy. Puffs out a room full of smoke in about 10 seconds. Um, but, yeah, that would be a good idea. I was thinking, like, if I vaped, I could just, like, vape into it. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't vape, so... Samsung put balls in their speaker boxes in the phone to make the sound deeper. Really? So I'd only do two a week if I could retain the same quality. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try and bust out two a week and, and have the quality suffer. Um, so I could try two a week and see how it goes. But um, but if I feel like the quality is going to suffer, then I'll just slow it, slow it back down again. What about one every day? What about a daily? I could do them daily, but in order to do them daily, I'd have to record and film like, I don't know, 40 of them in advance. So you'd have like a gap of like a few months. <laughs> Where I wasn't, where you don't get any boom or bust, and then you get daily episodes for like a month or so. Yeah, daily would be impossible to do like in real time. I'd have to just do them all in advance and then just release them one by one. Yeah, this old soldering iron is massive, man. Chunky boy. Right, I think I think we probably have finally relieved these solder pads of all of their solder. So let's have a look on the board and see what we got. So we have burn power supply over here. So let's get a bit of isopropyl on that, clean it up. Yo, a 20, Baba, thank you very much, my guy. You know, you know, you know something interesting. I know pe people are, are really, um, really care about the likes on videos and stuff. I, I don't actually care that much. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've really ever said go and like and subscribe. I don't really care that much. Um, I think that the people that are interested in the content and they will stick around, will stick around anyway, regardless of what the algorithm does. So if you're liking the video, stick around. You don't have to like it. You don't even have to subscribe. The YouTube algorithm is so good these days that it will, just, it will reliably send videos your way to a channel that you're interested in, even if you're not subscribed to them. So yeah, it would be cool for my own ego to see my subscriber count go above the 100k eventually at some point. <laughs> but I'm not really too fast. All I really care about is interaction and um, yeah, interaction with you guys. My favorite thing about YouTube is comments. Oh my god, literally. When I release a new Boomer Bus video, I'm sitting there like every 10 seconds, refresh. Ha, <laughs> refresh, refresh. I'm just reading the comments that come through. Absolutely my favorite thing about YouTube. I don't care about likes, I don't care about subscriptions. Don't care about whatever else bullshit YouTube algorithm stuff uses. All I care about is what you guys think because you are the humans in this. You're not 
the algorithm, you're not the bot, you're not a number on my screen, you are actual people giving me your actual, sharing your actual thoughts about something that I put my hard work into. So I don't care about anything else, I just care about comments. So don't, don't bother liking my videos, don't bother subscribing, just comment and let me know what you thought about it. That's all I care about. Even if it's, even if it's constructive criticism, I'd, I would generally much rather you, you left a comment saying, hey, this was cool, but this would be better instead, or didn't really like this part of the video. I'd much rather you did that than even liked and subscribed, so. Are there any dead gate resistors on here? Yeah, a few of these are dead, so we're probably going to go ahead and change all of them anyway. But yeah, thanks so much for the 20, Baba. That is very, very generous of you. It's quite a lot of money to just shove into someone's face over the internet, so massively appreciate that, buddy. Thank you very much. Yeah, why not do both? Yeah, why not do both, I suppose, but... Do both if you like, but I don't really. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be one of those YouTubers that um, absolutely in every like video, every five seconds, just like subscribe, please like the video, hundred likes, and I'll do this. I can't believe it. Is that actually real? That's insane. Mm-mm. That was a surprise, wasn't it? We weren't expecting that. I'm only at £1.75 now or something stupid. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there was only one bank of power supply fets that failed because this failure was caused by a little bit of metal swarf that got stuck between the MOSFET and the thermal pad. So the MOSFET shorted to the heatsink. So I only took out one bank of fets here. Um, so all the other gate resistors are going to be fine. They are all reading within spec at 10 ohms. Yep, 10 ohms there. 10 ohms, 10 ohms, 10 ohms, and that's the last one from the other bank. Cool, cool, cool. So let's replace all the gate resistors on this bank here that failed. 
First thing I'm going to do is just freshen up the solder pads with some fresh leaded solder because that lead free stuff is just the worst, right? Jan says, what I think is, I started watching your vids years ago, and I still keep watching whenever I can. If you provide the same quality content as you do. Thank you very much, Jan. I appreciate that. I'll just kind of try my best, do what I do, and uh, you guys seem to like it, so I guess I'll carry on. Man, don't eat some... Oh, man. 100 likes and I'll eat some solder flux. 100 likes. 100 likes and I'll do something that may drastically impact my health and lifespan for literally a number on the screen yeah I'm sure there's plenty of those that have gone on you know what I think is actually probably worse for you than solder flux solder paste no not solder paste sorry thermal paste I hadn't really realized it but thermal paste is actually well going by the sticker on the back of my thermal paste pot pretty horrendous I suspect that um, thermal paste and solder flux combined pose far worse worth health risks than the lead in leaded solder does. Seth, how's it going? I've been alright. Been good. Been uh, filming and editing Bo uh, Bob, Boomer Bust. I like that. I like the Boomer Bust uh, shortens down to Bob. <laughs> Do you ever see pads that lift easily on cheap PCBs? Yeah, absolute nightmare. Some of them, you lit the second your soldering iron touches the pad it's already fallen off it's like what you what are you supposed to do in that situation it's like can you consider doing some modification to brazilian amplifier on crossover controls to carry it down lower most of the brazilian amplifier crossovers already actually play down more than low enough um like flat down to 20 hertz the issue is, is that a lot of people will turn up the subsonic or high pass a little bit and because the amplifier is full range even turning it up a tiny bit suddenly you've got a massive slope at like 50 hertz or something like that so keep it all down at minimum don't touch the don't touch the controls keep all the controls down at full left position full minimum on like 99 percent of brazilian amplifiers and uh, you'll be absolutely fine Yeah, I've lost plenty of items of clothing to thermal paste. One recently, actually. Um, yeah, a new game came out um, on Steam recently, and I've got a hoodie that had, like, the branding on the hoodie, and I was uh, replacing a CPU in a friend's motherboard or something, and I accidentally got thermal paste on my hoodie, and it is just ruined. Like, it's, like, bleached it, or there's the stain is just there forever now. Really, really, really annoying. Do you use a carbon filter or vent in your workplace workspace? I really want to actually. I have actually got a um, extractor, a big chunky extractor fan um, that I need to repair, and I was going to install it into the workshop somewhere. But it's difficult because I don't want to cut a massive hole in my ceiling if I can avoid it. Like I will if I have to, but if I can avoid it, I'd rather not because um, I'd like to have the fumes actually piss off up into the loft, out into the air. You know, I'd. You can get ones with filters and stuff, but in my head, I'm like, eh, the filter, yeah, it's filtering, but is it really filtering everything? It's just kind of chucking the air back into the room. I want it away, out, gone. So, um, yeah, I need to try and figure out something that's powerful enough that I can have in front of my desk here. Um, let's get my phone out of the way. So, something powerful enough that I can have in front of my desk here, like a nozzle, like Rossman has, like a kind of big nozzle here that I can bring up over the board here that actually has some real power to it. Uh, maybe have like a filter over the front just to prevent stuff, MOSFETs flying up it. Um, and then have a tube 
go up somewhere into the loft or out of the house somewhere. Yeah, I've been meaning to do that do that for absolute ages because I know a lot of the fumes in here are, are not good at all. They're they're pretty bad. They sell activated charcoal cabin filters for cars. You can 3D print an enclosure and for it and suck the bad stuff out at least. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever I end up doing will probably end up including some 3D printing of some kind. Um, so it'll be a project uh, for, for soon. Yeah, for sure. Just want to try and work through some repairs because I've got a lot of repairs on at the minute. A lot of stuff that's backed up. Uh, a lot of boom or bust videos as well to do so. It should be high priority, but because it, it's my health, but um, at the end of the day, it's not going to pay the bills any quicker. So, my flux has nearly run out, but fortunately, I did. Finally, buy a replacement. <laughs> this is the flux I use. If anyone's interested, it is literally the best flux I have ever, 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 ever used. This is amazing stuff. This. If you're not happy with your flux, get this instead. You'll thank me. SMD twenty nine thirteen zero CC from Chipquick. Really awesome flux. Oh, the metal needle is much better as well than the plastic one. Yeah, definitely. I think it must have come with a metal needle before, and I just either missed it in the box or didn't put it on for some reason. But yeah, the metal needle is much nicer. I'm not sure why that, why I haven't been using that one for the last three years. It is not cheap, don't get me wrong, this flux is not cheap, but I was actually trying to think the other day, I was thinking, how long have I had this 30 gram syringe for? I think I've had this for like over, I think it, I think it is over three years. I can tell you actually, because I can look on my emails, when did I, when did I last order Chip Quick? Let's have a quick look, I'm really interested now, how long has that lasted me? Holy crap, there was 114 viewers at the start of this stream, and it has gone down to 72 now. It's because this is relatively boring repair, but that's fine. How do you spell it? Chip, chip, quick, Q-U-I-K. 
so yeah I ordered this one I ordered this one in on the 13th of April 2020 so 21, 22, 23. so yeah almost three years and it's still going actually it's, it still has some in it um, I reckon that that wall this this amount that's left in it will probably last me another couple of months so yeah three years so it is expensive it's like 45 pounds but I think for three years that's not bad <laughs> Have you tried the proper Amtech stuff? I don't think so because I don't recognize that um, that name there. Amazon has fans for indoor gardening that I use. The carbon filter is incredible. Interesting. <laughs> Wait, hang on a minute. <laughs> Clear out any smell and leaves the room smelling sanitized. Hmm, I wonder what smell you could be trying to get out of a room real quick that has something in... in in common with the gardening. <laughs> Matt K trying to send the link. Oh, okay, I'll have a look on it in a bit. What O scope do you use? I use a HP 5462B. Any thoughts on using high quality film caps when recapping amps or just recap every 10 years? Um, film caps are obviously bi-directional and film caps have a much lower capacity for their size. So film caps are great for um, use after the filter inductor because you don't need a high capacitance. You just need a very, very, very low ESR and you need them to be bi-directional. Um, for rail capacitors or power supply filter capacitors, um, the capacitance does make a bit of difference, especially in the rail capacitors. Um, the ESR, yeah, it helps out, but if you've got so many of them in parallel, then the ESR isn't really an issue. You want the high capacitance there. Um, so I wouldn't ever replace rail caps or anything with, with um, film caps. Right, I think that's all the gate resistors mounted, so let's start dropping in some fresh FETs. We don't need to power it up and check the um, drive circuit, it's going to be absolutely fine. You know what? I'll tell you something that annoys me a little bit about these high powered MOSFETs, right? So right now we're dropping in IRF 1404s. So these are pretty powerful MOSFETs, okay? However, shut up, turn that off. However, their bottleneck is not the silicon necessarily. The bottleneck of these MOSFETs is actually the legs the package legs, the TO220 MOSFET legs, these actually fuse at a lower current rating than what the silicon can handle. So beyond a point, there becomes a point where really it's kind of a waste of time putting any higher power MOSFETs in something. Because, well, I think it's slightly different with um, switching. Um, you know, pulse drain and stuff like that, because obviously it will take some time for the legs to fuse. So you can actually pass higher current than the legs will take continuously in a short burst. But for constant current applications, the legs will fuse quicker than the silicon will fail, which I think is pretty stupid. I'll send you a link in a minute actually to um, actually guys keep keep a tally keep a tally of things that I'm going to show you once I've finished this amp right one of them is um, gonna be so keep a tally first thing I want to show you is some ridiculously powerful surface mount MOSFETs that could be used in an amplifier secondly I'll, the next thing I wanted to show you was what else what was the other thing I wanted to show you uh, obviously we're gonna look at the boom or bust episode 4 boxes and see what we're gonna print there was one other thing as well. I was like, oh yeah, once I finish this, I'll show you guys. I can't believe what it was now. 
Amtec Flux is what Rossman uses. I use it too, and it's so much better than the cheap stuff. But I've never tried Chip Quick. I suspect it's probably similar to this Chip Quick stuff. This Chip Quick stuff is not cheap either. Um, and I was recommended it by a um, an industry professional. So it's probably good stuff. And it works great for me in, in this application. I think it's technically marketed as um, lead-free. So it's, it's specifically for use with lead-free solder. Um, which is probably why it's so good, because lead-free solder is such a bloody pain in the ass. Anyway. Ah, now, something interesting. Paros have sent me two different batches here. Well, at least two different batches, maybe more than two, but different batches of MOSFET here. So we've got some WL2... WL21 batch and some AT71 batch. So let's have a look with the MK328 and see whether there's any vast differences between these two. So this is the WL21. We have 3.1 volt VT, 9.81 gate capacitance. The RDS, you can kind of ignore that because um, it's so low this tester can't read it reliably. So we're looking for the VT to match. That's the most important thing. Yeah, VT matches 3.1, although the gate capacitance is quite a bit higher on that one. Let's see if that's a trend. Because if that's a trend, I might actually um, take really good care in putting these in their own, you know, matching the batches per bank. So this is another AT71. All right, let's drop another WL21 in. Let's see if that's back down at uh, nine nanofarad gate capacitance. This button is, is really bad. Okay, yeah, so... Oh, that's a 3.3. So the WL21 batch does have a slightly lower gate capacitance. So it will be a good idea to try and keep these in the same um, banks as each other for each transformer. So we've got four transformers on each side. So push, pull, push, pull. So yeah, two MOSFETs push, two MOSFETs pull. That's really, really easy to match up. Da -da, da -da. Yep, that's looking good. Mr. EE100 going mobile. Man, I really appreciate the dedication to the stream. Even though you're going out, you're staying with me on the, uh, on the old mo mobile. Thanks very much, buddy. Appreciate that. Hey Sam, what do you think about the fume extractors? Since the solar fume are very dangerous for the technician. Yeah, that's that's literally what we were just talking about. So um, I was telling everyone here that I want to get a, a proper fume extractor system installed that extracts the fumes outside of the room, up into the loft, into the outside world. Um, it's just it's a project that I need to look into as soon as I can, because yeah, it's very bad. I mean, I've been doing amplifier repair now for shit. When did I even start? When did I start doing amp repair? I think, is it five years now? Maybe? And um, I've not really taken too much care about fume extraction for those those number of years, which isn't great. So I do need to jump on it as soon as I can, really. It's really going to bug me now. What did, what is it I said earlier that I'd show you? I'd be like, oh yeah, the other thing I was going to show you guys was the um, the audience retention graph of Boom or Bust. So we can see where people are interested in watching. That was the other thing. Audience retention, Boom or Bust episode 4 box. We can all decide together. And um, damn, I've got the other thing now.
gonna make a note of these because I'm gonna forget them otherwise. Right, notepad. Bob, episode four. Um, retention. And the third one was, can't remember. Oh, service mount MOSFETs, that's right, yep. Thank you very much, got lows. I seem to have way more AT71 batch vets here than I do the, uh, the other ones. What do you think about vacuum tube amps? I have never worked on one, never listened to one, never used one, so don't really have much to say about them, I'm afraid. I know that they add, even order harmonics, harmonic distortion, they add distortion. Um, I think I'm probably a bit more of a purist. I'd rather have something that is as true to the original source as possible and not add any coloration or character to it, um, if possible. But um, I know lots of people love the sound of uh, tube amplifiers, the, dis the distortion that they add, so maybe I'd like the sound of it. But yeah, I've never actually really listened to one, so hard to really comment. Shouldn't work on Saturdays. Well, I work for myself, so Saturdays are actually the best day for me to work because on Saturdays, all the snotty kids are out of school and they're all like hopping around the shops and screaming and shit. So, the best days for me to stay at home in the workshop and do some amp repairs is Saturday and Sunday <laughs> and half term. All the other days, Monday to Friday, I'll go out, go to the park, go shopping when it's nice and quiet and you just got Derek and, and Deirdre and Esmeralda. Doing their um, doing their shopping in Marks and Spencers, and it's much quieter. Seth says, I'm watching this in my car right now, using Samsung DEX on my phone through HDMI to my head unit. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in your car, Seth. Boom! What can, what can I do? Guys, how can we troll Seth? I'm in his car. Have you got a system hooked up? Can I play something really bassy through the mic? Uh, what have I got? What have I got that's really, really bassy? I don't know. What's the resonant frequency of this diamond driver? There, I can just slap this, and that might be bassy. There you go. How's that sound through your sub, Seth? Your Boomer Bust series is cool. How did you come up with the idea? Uh, I got heavy inspiration from the Fan Showdown by Major Hardware on YouTube. Well, I'm a big fan, no pun intended, of that series. And I thought, oh, you know what, how cool would it be to, to, do, to do something similar to this, but for for audio for sub boxes so yeah heavily inspired by the fan showdown absolutely no shame in admitting that Jordan says, yeah, we work for ourselves too, and it's way better getting errands done during the day, during the week, than on weekends. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, it's just much nicer and quieter out there, isn't it? Hey! Armin says, what are those circles in the middle of the PCB? Well, let's have a look at that. Because, I don't see these very often either. and So I've never really dove into looking into what they are actually for. So if we have a look at the PCB here, we can see that we have obviously the power supply transformers there, and then there are some inductors that are sitting down the middle here. 
So, yeah, I'm not actually sure. I haven't really looked too much into what they are. I assume there's some kind of noise filtering. Um, they might be working in series with the um, rectifiers here. So, let's have a look. On the back, where do the traces go? So, we've got... Uh, they go like that. So, they come out of the... Oh, no. Ah, no, they're in line with the 12 volts. Okay, looks like they're in line with the 12 volts. So what they do is they are in line with the 12 volt supply coming in from the um, coming from the, the battery terminal, and they prevent any switching noise from the power supply section working its way back down your power cable and resulting in noise throughout the rest of your system. Really cool to see them in an amplifier this powerful. Rarely ever see them in something this big because obviously they're going to have resistance. So they're going to actually have some voltage drop across them and maybe suffocate the power supply section a little bit. But obviously PowerS have designed this with thick enough cables in a way that that doesn't occur. Um, you know, the, 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 the voltage drop across these inductors is going to be negligible um, and the benefits are much, much uh, outweigh the, the downsides of having that there. You see it in smaller amplifiers, especially from the likes of Alpine, JBL, stuff like that. Um, yeah, there'll be an inductor that's in series with the 12 volt supply uh, coming into the amplifier just to suppress any noise from, from working its way back out. So inductors, inductors resist changes in voltage or changes in current. So if you, uh, there's a really, really cool electronics kit, which actually isn't electronics. It's a mechanical kit that simulates electronics in a mechanical way. Um, and that was what really helped me to understand what inductors are and how inductors work. So inductors, they have inertia. So think of them like a, a cable, but that has some inertia. So they'll let low frequencies through um, because the lo low frequency is, a, is applying the current for long enough that to overcome the inertia of the inductor. However, high frequencies that are going backwards and forwards very fast, they, they don't hold their current in the same direction for long enough to overcome the initial inertia of the inductor. So therefore, they just get... They, 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 don't, they don't pass, um, they just get kind of eaten up by the inductor, by the inertia. Think of, think of an inductor like a fidget spinner, okay? So let, let's say you've got a fidget spinner in line with your circuit, okay? So and think of the voltage, think of, think of the power, the current going through your system as rotational energy, okay? So you, tur you turn a crank like this, okay? And the, the spinning motion, the kinetic spinning motion goes through the circuit, through cogs and stuff like that. So in, in, this, in this kind of uh, thought model, an inductor would be like a fidget spinner. So it'd be a weighted rotating mass. So once you turn the crank, there's a bit of extra force you have to apply to get that fidget spinner up to speed. But then once it's up to speed, it doesn't put any additional stress or load on the system on that on the, the, the way that you're cranking the, the handle. 
if you if you crank the handle um, quite slowly one way and then quite slowly back the other way, slowly one way, slowly back the other way, then obviously the the fidget spinner will spin up and spin down, and you'll feel a bit of resistance as as its inertia, you know, causes some some kind of kickback onto the the crank that you're turning. However, if you try and cause the crank to go backwards and forwards very very fast in a very short stroke, like, doo -doo 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 -doo, then the the fidget spinner will just kind of barely spin it will just it just barely oscillate around its around its its um midpoint here because you're not giving it enough energy to overcome the initial inertia of the fidget spinner getting up to speed so it just kind of sits there and doesn't actually pass on the energy that you're putting into the crank um it, it, so i'm trying to think of best better way to explain this but there, there is a really good video actually that shows that there's a there's a, a kit you can buy for your kids that helps them to understand electronics but in a in a physical mechanical um thought model and it's, it's really really cool uh, no so this amplifier failed because when it was assembled at the factory a tiny piece of metal got in between the back of one of the power supply mosfets and the thermal pad um, causing it to eventually the piece of metal like penetrated the thermal pad and shorted the MOSFET to the heatsink. That's why this amp failed. So it was an assembly assembly error, assembly fault. Just a really unfortunate one. Um, very, very easy to miss, something like that. Spintronics, that's it. Blake has got it. If you if you want some if you want to, if you want to get your kids into electronics, or even if you you as yourself want to understand how electronics works in a really, really good Meta metaphorical way, um, look into Spintronics. It is absolutely fantastic. In the same um, in the same thought experiment, a capacitor. Is like a, um, it's like a loading up a spring, like um, you know those toy cars that you used to get as a kid, and you you pull them back, and then you let them go, and they whoom, they got like a, you know, like a sort of spring mechanism inside that as you pull it back, it winds up the spring, and then you let go, and it goes. Um, so that that would be like a capacitor in this thought experiment. So you you turn your crank like this. Um, and um, yeah, you're, you're charging up the capacitor like that, and become a point when obviously the capacitor is charged. And then, uh, and then there, you, and then, then obviously it can then release its energy through a through a load that that you attach to the cog. So what I'm doing now is I'm just tacking the um, gate leg into the board because that has a really low thermal mass. So I can just tack the gate leg in from the top of the board and then we can flip the circuit board over and solder all of the high thermal mass traces onto the uh, circuit and the back like this. So I'm considering, I wonder whether my little 60 watt iron would actually, would actually do this or whether I need to get the big one back out. Oh yeah, yeah. I think the sixty watts enough. Just holding it on there for a little bit, little bit longer, just to help the solder to flow through to the other side. Yeah, that seems to be all right.
Good question there from Kyrie, I think is how you say that name. Um, when we're replacing the rail caps, if the replacements don't have the plastic tops, um, would it be okay if they're exposed? So the, basically, yes, it can be an issue if they're exposed because a lot of car amplifiers um, have the back plate is made of metal, which is obviously connected to the rest of the heat sink, which is ground. So basically, yeah, if, and, and a lot of the time, the capacitors are very, very close to the back plate because to fit in, to fit the um, height of the capacitor and to keep the amplifier low profile for use in a car, the capacitors are usually very close to the metal back plate. So, um, yeah, you, you do generally want to isolate the um, isolate the uh, capacitors, the uh, metal bits. And you can just do that with some electrical tape. You don't have to get the ones that have the plastic top. You can just isolate them yourself with some, with some electrical tape or some tester tape or something like that. Yeah, tube amps definitely look super, super cool. Um, and there's quite a lot to be said actually about how how something looks can influence what it sounds like to you. Like if you've got a pair of speakers that to, to your mind's eye look absolutely beautiful, like yeah, the surrounds look looks really nice and smooth and rubbery and you know the cones are nice really really lovely material and the cabinet is you know constructed really nicely it's all curved and it's all smooth and everything if it looks really nice then you will actually apply a little bit of positive bias towards how it sounds versus something that looks really crappy that maybe has duct tape on the cone um, in a really shabby box that has a bit of water damage, perhaps. Um, even if on paper they sound identical, even if they, you know, you run an impedance sweep and or you run a phase sweep, and you know, even if they are acoustically identically sounding, you probably prefer the sound of the one that looks really nice because your mind does put a, a bias on things sounding how they look. It's actually, it's actually possibly one of the reasons why Taramps gets um, a fair bit of stick from people. They uh, they have experience with a Taramps amplifier. They buy one. It feels very lightweight. It has really cheap feeling potentiometers on the side for gain and for low pass, etc. You know, they're they're very lightweight feeling. They're not very heavy. They're kind of plasticky and don't turn very smoothly. Um, you have a look inside of them, and they, and they look a lot more empty than an older style circuit does. Um, th there's a lot about the, the newer amplifiers that can give a negative bias towards how they are perceived. And as a result of that, people can think they don't sound as nice. Right, that's one side done. I think it's even order harmonics that the ones that um, tube amps generate introduce into the signal. I think the odd order harmonics are ones that sound pretty pretty jank. I could be wrong though, but I think I think that's the way around that it is.
an ideal valve amp doesn't color the sound any differently from a transistor amp. So if that's the case, then what's the benefit then of the valve amp anymore? People go for the valve amps or the tube amps because they have a certain sound character, which is on paper defined by the introduction of, I believe, even all the harmonics. So if you have a valve amp that doesn't do that anymore, then why not just use a transistor amplifier that is more powerful and has a bit more headroom? Transistor amplifiers are so um, so dialed in now, so perfected, the distortions are so low that any differences will be negligible in that regard. Yeah, coolness factor, I guess, is the thing, yeah. Huh, that's a really cool um, bit of information, Blake. Distortion from progressive suspension is also even order, which is why it sounds really good. That's cool, I didn't know that. That's a really cool bit of information. My first system was an Altai sound lab, two times 75 watts. Uh, are we talking about first car audio system or just like first hi-fi system as a kid? car audio. Um, so my first, um, technically first car audio setup, um, I didn't change the the um, head unit initially, uh, I just had a pair of Pioneer TSW212 SPLs in a sealed box, sealed prefab box, uh, t twin 12 prefab on a Vibe Monobox 4, which was an old um, HIP4080 based amplifier that was running that chip bloody hard on some buffers to get 1500 watts out of it. So yeah, it's about 14, 1500 watts RMS at uh, one ohm mono between the, um, between the 212 SPLs. Sounded real nice to be fair. I was quite happy with that. Then after that, I um, upgraded the box to a much larger sealed box that sounded quite nice. Then I stuck some ports in it that were too small. Then I built a proper box, I say pro like a, a proper ported box for it, for them, which made them absolutely come alive. It was freaking awesome. Um, then I bought a bigger amplifier, loudest.com, and Accidentally killed one of the 212 SPLs because that was quite a lot of power for those. Those are only 750 watts RMS and I bought a 3000 watt amplifier. So then I bought the big, the better versions, the uh, 3004 SPLs, ran them on the loudest.com amp at, uh, at 4 ohms. So I was actually only getting about, I was actually only, get, only getting about 2000 watts. I was getting about 1000 watts per sub, which is about right. That's about how they're rated. In a nice big ported box and that absolutely slammed it sounded freaking awesome um, then i decided in my infinite wisdom that i was going to try and invert the subs and at the same time i wired the amp down to one ohm 
because um, it was a two channel amp, each channel was a 0.5, and in doing so, killed, uh, what it, I think I blew, I, I, I mechanically damaged the subs, and I killed the amp as well, so I killed the amp, and mechanically damaged the subs, fixed the mechanical issues on the subs, sold them, so I then had a working um, 3000 watt loudest.com amp, um, and a box for 212s ported, but no subs. Then I bought these uh, audio systems, Zion 15s. My favorite subs of all time, guys. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a toss up, okay? Audio system, Zion 15. See, that's not even the Zion that I had. I had the really beefy one. There we go. That's what I had. Xion 15 Plus. I think that's the one that I had. These were my all-time favorite subs. More favorite than my Digital Design Z4s that I currently own. More favorite than my RE Triple X v, uh, V3s. These things are absolutely beautiful. Absolutely love those. Really wish I never sold them. Don't think I'll ever find them again. So yeah, then I had a pair of those and I um, I cut the holes out bigger because obviously I had my 212s ported box um, for the Pioneers and I managed to just about squeeze the 215s in that and that sounded freaking incredible. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Banging system that was. The 215s in, in the small ported box. Um, you know, where I could really, really drive some power into them uh, and it sounded controlled. This was like 20, 2010, 2011, I think. Um, then I decided that I would upgrade the Zion 15s because I didn't realize how good they were at the time. I, th I didn't really know how good they were. So I thought I'll upgrade them to some DC Audio Level 4 15s. Big mistake. Those sucked. They were rubbish. Sold those on pretty quickly. And um, then I didn't have any 15s. So I found some RE Triple X V3s um, for really cheap. So then I got, then I got those. Um, and they sounded really nice. They were they were my second favorite subs. They were really cool as well. But the, the, these arms just 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 had the edge for me. Um, yeah. Then after that, after that, uh, what did I have after that? I think I just messed around with a few things. Um, then I then I was planning a big system. I planned to do a boot wall in the Proton, and I bought some Digital Designs ninety nine. 15s um, for for the Proton. They never ended up getting installed, and then I grew a bit older and and decided I didn't want to ruin my car with like um, you know base damage. So uh, yeah. I have a pair of those subs in my closet. Do you want them for free? <laughs> I don't know if Ellie's joking. What subs is that? Is that the what the Audio System Zions? I'd be I'd be very surprised if you did have a pair of them in your closet. They're pretty rare. Be awesome if you do though. I wouldn't want to take them off you for free though if you did. That's not very fair. Right, am I done? Have I soldered all of these on now then? Ellie, send me a, a message um, to facebook.com forward slash bearvids. Send me a picture of them. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're well, you're probably not in the UK, are you? You're probably outside of the UK. I imagine the shipping will be ridiculous, but um, I'd, I'd like to see them. I, I, don't, I don't think I would have any use for them. I wouldn't want to take them off your hands because I don't think I'll, like I said, I don't think I'd have a use for them. Oh, I could run them in the van instead of the Z4s. I could sell the Z4s, put some cash in my pocket and run the Zion 15s. That would be a throwback, wouldn't it? Oof. But um, yeah, let me know what they are. Send me a picture. <sighs> okay. Are we ready for testing? Let's just check for solder bridges.
to scratching through in between each of these pads just to absolutely make sure that there's no invisible solder strands that we can't see. And then we'll get some isopropyl on it. Is it nostalgia that clouds our judgment on past speakers? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think as well, another thing that is true is that at the time, they were the best thing that you'd ever heard. And obviously, as you start listening to better and better stuff, you, you hear better, better and better stuff. But at, at the time, I was like, these sound incredible. Um, and um, in more recent times, as I've sort of done more with audio, I get less impressed by stuff, the, the, the better stuff I listen to. So I think in my mind, I'm like, I still have the excitement of how the uh, audio system sounds sounded. Um, so yeah, I think there is a bit of nostalgia that, that clouds the judgment on how good things were in the past. Right, let's plug some power into this board then and just see whether that's uh, all good to go now. Yeah, not much flex on this board at all, considering how big it is and how heavy it is. Really, really impressive stuff. Uh, so the issue with this amplifier was that there was a bit of metal in between one of the power supply MOSFETs and the thermal pad which caused it to short to the heat sink killing one bank of power supply FETs. The output section is absolutely fine in this. Okay, let's give it some power, see what she's got. Is that the LTT screwdriver? Yes, it is. It was very, very kindly gifted to me by a follower. Good old 90N20Ds, all doing all right on the output side.
Let's build some rail voltage. Holy shit, the rail voltage in this is high. This is a 0.5 ohm version. Why is the roll voltage so high? Ooh, this is getting scary. I didn't think the roll voltage was this high. This is a 0.5 ohm version, which means the roll voltage should be half of what it would be if it was a half bridge. And this is a full bridge, so the roll voltage is half again. 140 volts. Well, that's only plus minus 70. That's not actually that bad, is it? It just seems like a lot. Okay, there we go. Uh, I think we had output switching there. There we go, output switching. Um, let's just check the power supplies are alright. I don't want to leave the output side switching for too long, so let's have a quick look at the power supply side. How can I can I disable the output switching? I think I can really easily on this amplifier. Um, but uh, to prevent doing any more solder work, I'm just going to connect up a load at the speaker terminals, just because amplifiers like this don't like running without a load on the speaker terminals. So let's just hook up a load really quick so I can leave it on for a minute. Okay, so should have about 16 ohms across the terminals now. Yep, there we go. Okay, check that power supply. It's got some pretty big spikes on it. Five amps worth of idle current draw. It is very spiky. Okay, let's just wait for, I think the MOSFETs might be warm from being sold. I'm just going to let the MOSFETs um, cool down a little bit. And I just want to see whether they increase in temperature when we idle it for a minute. Is the power supply the same and the rail voltage can be selected with jumpers? No. No. To, to go between 0.5, 1 ohm and 2 ohm versions, basically over like 30% of the components on the board need to be changed. You need, you need different um, you need different transformers, you need different output MOSFETs, you need different um, output inductors, probably different uh, output filter capacitors, different rail capacitors, uh, probably different value gate resistors and stuff on the drive circuit, different protection circuit components. Yeah, like loads needs to be different. Uh, also different rectifiers as well. So yeah, loads and loads of stuff needs to be changed to go between 0.5, 1 ohm and 2 ohm versions. Uh, just while waiting for the uh, MOSFETs to, uh, to cool down a little bit um, from being soldered, let's have a quick look at um, yeah, let's have a quick look at how Boom or Bust is doing. How many people are watching right now? Fifty six. Holy shit, that is low. Not many people that that keen. But all you guys that are here, you are the real, real OGs. You are the you are the guys that stick around. So let's have a quick look. So for Boom or Bust. Have a look at the old channel here. Go to uh, go to content. So let's have a look at the first episode. Okay. If we look at audience retention on this one, you can see that we start off here. Um, 
Obviously, this is standard with YouTube. When the video starts, most people skip ahead straight away. So we've got about half of the people that started watching the video still watching here at the intro. Then we have people dropping off. This is this is during the um, the part where I'm talking about the uh, date and dates, the impedance curve. Then a few people skip ahead and skip this part and watch just the video demos, demos of the driver playing in the uh, test cabin. Quite a lot of people see a few seconds of that, maybe 10, 20 seconds of that, and then skip ahead again, get a dip there. Then people come back a little bit to the DB testing. But people generally drop off during the DB testing. A little spike here at the uh, results, just before the results come in. But yeah, only 24% of people are actually staying to the results of Boom or Bust. So, but that's pretty standard. Like that's just, that's a normal YouTube video. You don't get 100% of people staying sticking around for the whole video, especially where it's a 20 minute video. So this video is half an hour long. If this was 40 or 50 minutes long, this would drop off even further, and you'd have even lower retention. Let's have a look at um, this one here. This second one. This second one's done really well. This is doing way better views than um, than the first one. You can see again, we've got a big spike there where the demo starts. So people not that interested. Well, lots of people are. Obviously, 45% of people who started the video are still interested in the um, frequency response, the, uh, the impedance sweep. But some people jump ahead to the demos. Then people drop off a bit and come back for the DB testing. And then there's a little bump here where the results are. See that little bump where the results are? And that's again, that's about 20, that's about 30% worth of people. I don't know if the analytics are up for this one yet because it's still a very new video. Yeah, so this one's not actually ready yet. So we can't quite tell. But uh, what's another video that did well recently? So we've got the um, Can You Hear a Difference video. <coughs> so the retention on that one is actually much lower. Uh, it's actually a shorter video. So actually, that this tells me that the boom or bust videos are actually great for retention. Like, this was a cool video, this um, JBL versus Taramps. But um, a lot of the content on the end was just demo content, which people had already made, maybe made a decision by then. The difference vid didn't actually get that much hate at all. I was very surprised. People respected the experiment that I produ that I did. Um, you know what? I wish I wish this video got more views. Bench testing amps, measuring TS parameters. The thumbnail sucks. The title sucks. So I get it. I need to make a better thumbnail and title for this one. But I love this video. This was this was loads of fun. This was an old school style video. Um, yeah, generally people watching, people that watch to the 25% mark are generally watching to the end. <laughs> so, you know the head unit video that I did, the Atoto video, I actually made a um, even longer video. So you see, the, the, the uh, head unit video was already 36 minutes long, but I actually originally uploaded a 50 minute video that had loads more detail. But I thought, ah, people aren't gonna stick around for that. F people are gonna see 50 minutes and they're not gonna watch it or they're gonna skip through it. So I tried to, I tried to bring it down even smaller. Um, I cut out a fair bit of detail information, um, a few bits of testing and stuff that I cut out to get it down to uh, 36 minutes. This one did quite well, 18k, it's not too bad. Not, not, that, not great retention on that one. But uh, yeah, I well, guess we'll see how the, how the new video does. It's currently 3 of 10, I think. Yeah, not doing too badly. Boomer Bust is definitely doing well, it's doing better than a lot of my other videos, so that's cool. I hope that it really picks up, and I hope that Boom or Bust ends up getting the kind of views that um, Big D gets on his amp dynos. That'd be really, really cool if that was uh, the case. So I also wanted to show you. Um, like, let's have a look at let's have a look at Boom or Bust. Let's decide. Let's decide what we're gonna what what box we're gonna choose for Boom or Bust episode four. So I'm gonna have a look through my downloads right here, and let's have a look at what we can choose. So, 
These are all of the ones that I have decided are ready to print as they are. There's a few in here that need some modification, either to the cutout size for the driver or they need the lid taking off or something like that. Um, so let's have a look at some of these and let's open Cura. And you guys can tell me what one you'd like to see next. I think Cura takes a little while to open. This PC isn't that powerful in the workshop. Is Cura actually opening? Hello? Oh yep, yeah, it's doing its thing. It's coming. Okay, here we go. So, let's drag in, um, let's have a look at this one. So this is going to be a big chunky one. So I'm, I'm not that keen on printing this one. It's going to use up, use up a lot of material. Um, it's going to take a long time to print. But this one is some kind of interesting, wait, where does the driver go? Wait, there's no cutout for the driver. Oh, maybe the cutout is in the lid. Not sure where the driver goes on this one. I think it might go in here. I need to message the guy about this one. But yeah, I think the driver goes in here. Then we've got dual aero ports into this chamber. Then we've got a port out to the cabin via this chamber. But then also another route out for the pressure out of this port. Very interesting. Um, obviously a massive, massive box. It's going to take a fair while to uh, print, I think, this one. Let's, see, let's have a look see how long Cura says that one's going to take to print. I wanted to submit a horn loaded, but I suspect it's too large even scaled down. Tiger, scale it down. Like, whack it open in a, in a program. Scale all the dimensions down by a factor of 6, or scale the volume by 216. And uh, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to see whether it will fit or not. I have no idea what this would be called in terms of order. So this is going to be 500 grams of PLA. That's half of an entire roll. It's going to take one day, 11 hours at my current settings. And it should print all right. But yeah, that's, that's one interesting one that we could print. So that's a possibility for episode four. What else we got? We have access panel. I think that's all the same guy. B yeah, BP8. I think it's an eighth order. I think it is that one. Uh, this one here is uh, kind of cool. This one would need to be doubled up. So we need to go multiply selected. So we need to print two of these and stack them on each other. I wonder if I can just quickly do that so you guys can see what it would look like. Oh, I can just flip it, can't I? Flip. Yeah, there we go. Move it up a bit. So yeah, we've got this one. So this one is a um, like an ABC box, dual vented. So we got it's, it's not quite a sixth order. It's uh, two vents basically. So not too big, but still relatively large. And inside we have yeah two an internal port that ports into a second chamber, and then finally out into the cabin. That's another possibility, another option for episode four. We've got uh, a sixth order. Now this is a more sensible size. Look at this. This is a more sensible 12 inch sixth order scaled. It's going to print nice and quickly, not use up that much uh, PLA. 12 hours, 185 grams. So yeah, that's a, that's a series tuned sixth order, that one. 
So I might do that one for episode four. What's this one? Ah, now this one, this one is freaking awesome. <laughs> this, how to explain this one? I think I can may maybe go to my downloads and show you guys uh, a picture that he sent over for this one. Um, I thought we downloaded a picture of this one. No, I have to find it somewhere else. Basically, the driver mounts inside here. See this circle? The driver's going to mount in here. Okay. This part can be lifted up and down. This top piece can be lifted up and down to change the tuning of this initial chamber. Okay. Then, it ports into this turbo-ass looking snail shape thing out into the cabin. Really cool, interesting design. No idea how it's going to perform, but that one caught my eye. This is the kind of design that I was like looking forward to getting because it's very out there, very different, very interesting. Now, obviously, this won't print in one go. I've got this uh, file in separate parts, but just so you can see it here. Um, so you've got this chamber here at the bottom here. So the woofer will fire into this bottom chamber here. Uh, and then it's got a sealed chamber behind the driver. Now obviously this infill is where the driver would be, because this isn't the file that, that I'm going to print, this is just like an example. Um, that's the driver basically, inside this sealed chamber here. And then that sealed chamber can be moved up or down to change the volume of the sealed chamber before it actually exits into the ported chamber. So I thought that was freaking awesome. I might do that one next. That was, that was one of the top choices that I had to do next, was the, uh, the turbo box there. Uh, what we got next? Good sixth lid print plan A. Then we've got this pyramid box. This was actually one of the first ones to be sent in. Um, so this is a pyramid shape kind of box with four ports, and then we also have a base for it. If I can move that out of the way, pyramid base. Here's the base. Come on, move, move over. So the base has this kind of lumpy bit that would hopefully direct some of the waveforms down and out a little bit. And we've got the four ports there as well. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know if that's tuned to a specific frequency, but I thought it might be really interesting to do. Won't take too long to print either. Both the base and the pyramid itself aren't going to take too long, I don't think. If I move these closer to each other, we'll get a better idea of print time. Twelve hours, two hundred grams, not too bad. That'll print all right. Yep. Yeah, it's going to print really nicely that one. So yeah, that one came in really early actually. So I might do that one next, possibly. See what you guys reckon. What else we got? A spare tire box. This one's kind of interesting. This one doesn't look like much. Okay. But the driver, and this one's going to be really quick to print as well. The driver is going to sit on this top piece here. Okay, so you see this lip? The driver is going to sit on this top lip. Then the back of the driver, the waves are going to, obviously you've got this, this chamber at the bottom here. And then you've got all these pillars, and it ports into this outer ring. So the port is down here. And it's a ba I guess it's like a base tube. So yeah, it's basically a base tube, and you've got the driver sitting in the top there, and the port is down here at the bottom. And that's only four hours to print, and only 89 grams, so that is nothing. That'll print super fast, really, really quick and easy to do that one. Ah, now this one was sent in by, I think it was Mitch that sent this one in. Um, this is in sections for printing. Have we got a picture of it assembled? No, I don't think we do. Uh, I think he sent me a picture of it assembled. Maybe if I can, should I see if I can find a picture of it assembled somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure I can log in just now. But basically this one is a dual chamber. It's very similar to that um, ABC box we saw earlier. The driver sits in here, in this chamber here. So you've got the driver on this one. The driver uh, loads into this first chamber. Then 
this piece here goes on the back of this chamber with a port into this second chamber which then ports to the outside world on here with a vent on this one so you got yeah basically two chambers one large chamber porting into a smaller chamber a bit like a exhaust box like a silencer box almost and then porting into the outside world so yeah which one out of those guys those guys would you guys like to see what, what do you reckon your favorite is out of those <sighs> they're not that big a couple of them are quite big but um I'd love to see the weird ninth order box. I think that that weird eighth, ninth order box is going to perform really well because it takes up so much space in the cabin. So it's going to change the acoustic properties of the cabin so much. I think it'll actually perform quite well anyway, but re regardless of the uh, crazy loading going on inside. The snail box is really cool, isn't it? Yeah. That cylinder one, that sounds like a horn with extra steps. <laughs> that looks like one of those 360 degree speakers. Yep. Um, looks like an omnidirectional tweeter. I don't think it would do much at the frequencies we're dealing with. The adjustable tuning looked cool. The Tower of Pisa, but as a sub, do the fourth, do the fourth order at the top. That's mine. What's the fourth order at the top? Did I miss one? Oh, boomer bust fourth order band pass. Did I miss this one? Let's let's drag this one in. Oh yeah, here we go, missed this one. This one's also really cool, because this one's a sensible size. So yeah, got a nice fourth order here, just very basic fourth order. Sealed chamber, ported chamber, lid, boom, done, easy. So yeah, that's one that, I, that I'll definitely do at some point, whether it gets done next or not, I'm not sure. But yeah, nice and quick, nine hours to print, nice and easy, separate lid, done. So, first one with the aeroports, Turbo Snail. You should change to a 0.6mm nozzle. Da, 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 da. Look what I ordered. I ordered a 0.6mm nozzle. So, yeah, I'm going to be changing that over pretty soon and they'll print much quicker. The new Cura version can adjust the print with enough to still print with very high detail. Yes, I have the, I think I have the new Cura. I think it's relatively new. This one downloaded it a couple of weeks ago. So I think for episode four, we're either going to do the Turbo Snail or the Ninth Order Band Pass. <laughs> There's a few that I need to modify. Um, let's, have a look, let's have a look at some of the ones I need to modify. I uh, need to modify, what's this one? This one, because it was printed, it was, it was, it was an STO file and it's got the lid on it, so it's not going to print very well. Um, but this is a nice simple ported box, just a slot port. You can see that there, slot ported box with it all folded around inside, so it could do that one. Could have that one going head to head with, oh we've got another fourth order in here actually. I think, uh, was it Blake you were saying? No, this, yours was the fourth order. So I could do a fourth order shootout. This is another fourth order that I need to modify because it won't print because it's got a lid on it. Um, but yeah, this one is a sealed chamber and then the ported chamber has a massive port area. So that could be interesting to see how that performs. So I need to modify that one. Let's have a look, what's this one? This is another fourth order. So we could have Battle of the Fourth Orders. That's three Fourth Orders that we could do in one episode against each other. All kind of similar-ish kind of designs, but different port lengths and areas and stuff. So it'd be cool to see what one does does the best. Uh, blah, 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 import models. This one is a regular slot ported box, as you can see. Just a, just a regular slot port with some nice smoothed edges. Um... It's the same one, just a different side, ported box one. Another regular slot ported box that we can put up, up against another one. Uh, pyramid, oh, I can delete those now because they were done. Scale box, let's have a look, what's this one? Another regular aeroported, uh, sorry, 
slot ported one there as well so yeah got quite a few ported boxes sent in so i think we could do like maybe two or three ported boxes for one episode to keep it interesting um there's i think there was one that i said was a no there's a couple in here that was a no um firstly this one i said was no because it was so massive it was um and the guy actually sent over a revised version of this one that was smaller um i i just knew that that one's just going to unload like crazy um this one this is a t-line again it's too big really the t-line the um line area is too big for this driver it'll probably be better if the box was much shorter wasn't quite as tall like the similar height to the driver itself but i honestly think that this t-line is just going to be too big i could do this one if you guys really want to see it but i, I honestly just think that the driver is going to unload too much with this box it's absolutely massive. If you, if you think about that being a 12-inch sub, it's absolutely massive. Way too much line area, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, there's a couple there that I've said no to so far. I think a mixture of wild designs and very practical sensible designs would be the best yeah that's what i'm trying to do trying to do some um interesting weird designs that maybe won't work but we'll see how they go anyway and some more sensible ones we do a series with passive radiator um probably not because a passive radiator is just a port but with limited displacement so the only reason you do passive radiators is if you're trying to keep the box as small as possible i don't think that's really what this series is about Mitch's one and the tube one I'm looking forward to the most. Cool. There's not many transmission lines. I've, I've only had one transmission line sent in and it's massive and I probably won't end up printing that one. So guys, if you want to design a transmission line, feel free. I'll probably do it. As you know, I have had a transmission line submitted, a really cool one. Why, why is it not in my good? Uh, I think it's because I, I hadn't decided, wait, there's one transmission line that was submitted that looks really freaking cool that I'm going to do. Uh, let me just let me just grab it. Uh, I need to log into my emails and grab it because it was on the PC downstairs. That's why it's not in these folders. Do -do -do. Okay, it was not sure. Here we go. I think it's in this thread. There we go. This this is this is one of the ones that I want to print. That is a uh, transmission line. I'll show you this one as soon as it's downloaded. The internet up here is kind of slow. It's very fast downstairs by the router. Right, here we go. This is the transmission line that I want to print. This is called the Not Sure V1.5. And uh, yeah, so driver mounts in this end. This is more the kind of transmission line I was hoping to see where the, the line area is the same area as the driver roughly. And then it curves around like a bad man and uh, exits out at the back there. Definitely want to print this one. I think it might be quite tricky to print um, based on all of the curvature and stuff, but I think it will work okay, provided I print slow enough and don't try and go too mad. I don't think it will need supports, but we'll see. Yeah, Cure is having a, a good fun time trying to slice this one. I think it might need some basic supports under this bit, for example. So I might need supports touching... Um, Touching the heat plate here, the base. Yeah, definitely needs some, some supports there because we've got this, this thing just appears in midair out of nowhere. So, yeah, it needs some, some supports for that. Um, but I think this one would be really, really cool to print and really cool to showcase it's quite big it is a big box this it's 381 grams takes one day three hours but um yeah i'm keen on doing that one i think i'll probably print this one when i get my 0.6 nozzle 
uh, connected up so it's quicker. But yeah, guys, I think I'm going to call it there for the stream. I'm just going to quickly test this amplifier one more time. So now that the MOSFETs have cooled down a bit, I just want to make sure that they're not running warm at idle. If they are, then I'm not really sure what to do about it because that will be just a design issue, I guess, because there's no, no problems with the drive circuit. Right, uh, let's power it up. And got my thermal imaging camera here so we can have a look, see whether the FETs are getting warm at all. Yeah, very big spikes on the back of these FETs here. Quite a bit of coil wine from the output section. Uh, yeah, cool. No, the MOSFETs are not heating up. I think it was just some residual heat from soldering. No, they're all running nice and cool. Yeah, that's good to go. Just needed new up, new power supply fets. Cool, yeah, so I'm going to leave the stream there tonight, guys. Thanks so much for keeping me company today while we've been looking at this uh, amplifier. Very boring one to repair, just just changing out loads of MOSFETs. Uh, not very interesting, no troubleshooting required. What about Paraflex designs? Yes, Boris. Yes, please. Somebody submit a Paraflex. Please. Please, somebody. Somebody design and submit a Paraflex box. That, if literally, if someone submits a Paraflex box tonight, that'll be episode four. I'm that excited about doing a Paraflex. As long as it's good. As long as it's actually a Paraflex that will work, by the way. Not just like someone that, not, not, don't just go and look at Paraflexes and be like, oh yeah, it looks, looks kind of like this and just kind of copy one from a picture. If you know how to design Paraflex, Please design a Paraflex, send it in to Boom or Bust, and I will print it ASAP. But yeah, nice one, guys. I'm going to go get some dinner. Thanks for keeping me company, and I will see you later. Bye.